Well, hello, Melissa. Well, hey, how's it going, Mike? It's going well. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to be here. Melissa, for those that haven't come across you online, Mm -hmm. tell our listeners what's hot. Why are we talking today? What's hot? Oh, my gosh. Probably side hustles are pretty hot. Gigs are hot. Yeah. Gigs. Years ago, I was in a band, and we called those gigs. Yep. What's a gig, though, in the non-musical band language? What does that mean? Yeah, I think I think we're just living in a world of gig economy. You know, I, I talk to so many different people, um, all walks of life, who have something outside their nine to five, right? So, um, you know, I've got people, I've got friends who are in the consulting services, and they consult on the side, whether it's in financial services or whether it's in real estate, um, friends in pharmacy that are running their gigs on the side with medical writing, um, you know, all the way down to our millennials who have all kinds of gigs, or even your Uber drivers who have that as a gig on the side. Um, I think that with um, the current state of affairs, especially with when this is airing with the whole COVID, um, the idea of a gig, a secondary income stream, Um, not really having all your eggs in one basket has become more and more um, mainstream, you know, the whole gig economy. That's huge, not having your eggs in one basket. And if people didn't realize it before, they sure will realize it now. Oh, yeah. Do I have to say gig to be cool? Do you have to say gig to be cool? Because I'm an old fart. What what would you like to call it? I don't know, gig, I guess. What was before side hustle. You'd call it a second income or a or a second job or you know. Second but but a second job doesn't sound fun because then it sounds like you're going to work the night shift at the 7-Eleven, which is fine, right. but that sounds like a second job. You're right. I think that's the delineation, right? Is the side yeah. gig versus a side job. I think people think of a gig as something they own, you know? They're doing and I and I think that a lot of folks like where I come from and the professional world, I come from corporate America, but people I think can sometimes wear one one mask at work and they're real corporatized and they have kind of this bubble that they live in and they're told what they can and can't do. And there yeah. isn't the autonomy and the creative piece that's able to come out. And so you find that some people gig on the side, not even for the money, it's more for a passion. You know, like I, I've got a neighbor who loves to construct boats, like those small boats yeah. that take, you know, six months to put together. Right. 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 Um, and and right. he's an attorney who makes great money, but this is a passion of his and that's his gig, right? His side thing that he owns, that he does. Now, when we say gig though, like in his case, would that be something that is typically associated with money? Does he sell something with that? Yeah. Because if not, then you have to just call it a hobby, right? Right. For sure. No, this guy's highly sought after for his, his boat building. Sometimes you don't want to necessarily label yourself as a entrepreneur because somebody says, well, what do you do, Mr. Entrepreneur? Well, I do this. And then maybe it doesn't quite hit everybody's expectation of that, even though everybody is, it might not hit the expectation. And so gig is just sort of a kind of a nice side. It, it kind of encapsulates it pretty well. For sure. It, it, it encapsulates ev- everything outside. I When I think of gig, I think of it as anything outside the nine to five, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What caused the growth of gigs and side hustle? Is it simple enough for me just to say computers and, and social media was a huge part of that? Or or does it go back before that? I mean, it seems to me it's just like yeah. small groups across you know the country finding like-mindedness and so on. And we know some of the negatives of that reaching into some of these underground groups that are rising up and so on. Well, for good and bad, depending on guess on what country and who's the leader and things like that. But <laughs> probably the internet's responsible for a lot of this. Anything else I'm missing? Well, yeah, I think that the internet became the vehicle to make it possible. Mm -hmm. I think that the one piece I would add is that I think we've come into a decade where people are revolting to just showing up to a nine to five for the sake of face, for being there, for clocking in. And what we're learning is that with technology, 
Um, you can be productive from home. I mean, oh my gosh, are we not learning that now for a lot of your listeners probably who are having to work from home for the first time ever. And thank goodness to technology, they're able to counsel patients, talk to their teammates, their business partners, right? Um, but I think that what uh, a recent poll, when they looked at millennials, um, you know, the average millennial would take, I think it was like a 30% pay cut to work for themselves than to actually work in a cubicle, uh, go to report to an office somewhere. So I think also what you're seeing is the backlash of reporting in and having to show face to just say you're working to be somewhere to create an income. And back to your point with the advent of technology as it is, the ability to create an income stream from home and work for yourself and not have a boss tell you what to do, where to go, when to be there, whether you have to work these certain days. In the nine to five, in your opinion, what are people revolting against? What is the, the deeper feeling? Well, I think in general, um, we're missing out on life. I think that a lot of, I know in my own profession and in my career, you know, I was a medical director and the pharmaceutical industry, I loved my job. I had a great job, a highly sought after job. The problem was I was never home. I was on an airplane um, or in an office somewhere and sacrificed a tremendous amount of time. And a lot of it didn't necessarily need to happen. Um, you know, week long meetings in places and um, you know, all the travel and that sacrifice for, for what? To, to, to not be able to be home um, and be a more present parent. Um, and just, and for me, for those who travel a lot, I didn't even know my community because I was never home. Devil's advocate. When you said nine to five, mm -hmm. that almost seems okay. But the nine to five throws in all the other stuff. What if it was truly nine to five? Would that make a difference in what your saying about being like married to your job and gone and your community and so on. Now, I know that most nine to fivers, as they get up and pay, don't have the luxury of being just nine to five. But if it was just nine to five, mm -hmm. let's take away the overtime and the travel and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because I understand that because people get worked to death at the corporate level and so on. Right. Right. What about a true nine to fiver though. Mm -hmm. If if I said, Melissa, no, you cut all the travel out and this and that, you're truly gonna do a nine to five. You know, you leave home at eight thirty, you get home at five thirty every day. There's not many of those out there, of course, at certain <laughs> levels. But if there was, is there still revolt there? Oh, I think for sure. Um, I work with especially the younger, the younger folks. I think that there's a, a tremendous amount of question of why do I have to, to drive in and be somewhere from nine to five o'clock if I can get my job done and my deliverables between nine and noon, mm -hmm. right? Or nine and two. Yeah. Um, it's that old adage of like having to, your face be seen in an office. And, you know, I, I, I'm in an industry where, you know, I can crank out two or three hours worth of work that's highly impactful, um, incredibly lucrative, um, and I'm done for the day. I've made huge impact, and now I get to go do other things, you know, besides just showing up for the sake of showing up, you know, just being punching in for the sake of punching in. Okay, but let's say that someone is paid handsomely for that. Mm -hmm. is, is there a deeper feeling then of something missing in life, or there autonomy or lacking creativity what do you think is the problem let's say someone could go from nine to noon and get all their job done and right. let's say nobody would know the difference but they're able to take a, a snooze from 12 till 5 or they're able to play video games or play on the computer <laughs> Right. What are they missing, though? I'm just trying to narrow down. What are people really missing with the 9 to 5? So let's take away travel. Uh -huh. Let's take away the financials. And let's say they get all their job done 9 to 12, but nobody notices them from 12 to 5. Right. Are they revolting still against something, against boredom, creativity? What are they, what are they revolting still against? Gosh, I mean, that's, that's a million dollar question for any, you know, for every person who has the itch. And I think that one thing that I would underscore is that not everyone 
has a desire to have a gig or to have their own autonomy. Yeah. So you would have to, you'd really have to ask that individual. Um, I think personally, from my own personal experience and the team that I lead, most people uh, realize that when they're able to scale back uh, their nine to five work and, and shrink the hours they work and they free up the other personal time, I see. it turns into things like being able to show up to your kids play in the afternoon right. or to be able to volunteer to read or to be able to actually get your <laughs> give back to the community in a greater way that you wouldn't have if you were you know plugged into a nine to five when you could actually produce and give out what you needed to from nine to 12, right? They picture maybe doing something that gives them maybe more freedom or something like that? For sure. I, I, at the end of the day, I think there's some of us have it in our DNA to be fr to be free and to to own our own time. You know, I'm one that I, I still work um, interesting hours that aren't a nine to five, right? And I'm super passionate about what I do. But it's around I went for a three and a half mile jog with my kids this morning because I can right, right. Um, and then got them kind of situated and then did a couple of conference calls and then I hopped on my peloton and then I did um, some you know some coaching so um, it's the it's the life by your design it's the business by your design that I think some people um, just love so for instance um, having to be stuck on conference calls yeah. Uh, when I'm on vacation, you know, like that's the piece of being attached to a nine to five right. that you can't ultimately disattach. What's the word? Disattach isn't a word. Unattach. Yeah. Um, detach. Detach. Yeah. You can't detach yourself from, you know, and so I do I do think there's a certain breed of people who just want that freedom and want that autonomy. One of my best friends is a retail pharmacist. She actually loves predictability and routine and punching in and punching out and being home and being done, you know, and like, she thinks what I do is insane. <laughs> you know? So it's just, it's a, it, I think it's a difference in, in personality. Some people couldn't imagine having to be organized with that freedom at your house to actually run multiple businesses. You know, right. some people like the structure. So I think it's just a difference in, um, in the, just what motivates you, um, what you want out of life. You know, for, for me, I'm a, I found out I'm a creative and I'm a serial entrepreneur and I wasn't able to do that giving all of my time to a corporation. I hear you there. For me, my problem at my independent pharmacy was always, I hated to have a thought that I couldn't move on pretty quickly. And when I say move on, I mean, at minimum, write it down at, at maximum, maybe spend 20 minutes on the computer looking up something and having to buy something on Amazon because I want that to come in. So in two days, I can do this. I just hated that feeling of being there at this pharmacy, you know, nine to whatever, one or nine to five. Recently, I've had some time off a couple of years, and now I've gone back to the store more, but it's, I've got it set up more now where it works around that goal of mine to be able to be detached every couple minutes if I need to, at least to do something for a couple minutes and come back. So it's not a lack of effort or wanting to work. I think for me, right. it was a lack of freedom it comes down to and not freedom to be like lying on the beach in Hawaii, just freedom to not have someone say, you've got to think about this for even a half hour right now. It's like, I don't want to think about that for a half hour. I want to think about this for a half hour. And this might be more difficult, but it just allows you to go with your ebbs and flows during the day. For sure. For sure. Well, and I think that that freedom, and this is what I have found, when you free people from significant time constraints um, and you allow space in their life, it's amazing the output that can come out, the creativity that can come out, the philanthropic, philanthropic um, output that can come out. There's, there's amazing good and creation that can happen when you pull people out of the, what I call like the blinders of like the nine to five grind of right. I'm putting one foot in front of the other because that's what I do every day, day in and day out without question. And this is what I'm gonna do for the next 40 years. And like I said, like my best friend in retail, she loves the predictability and she's totally, that's what she wants. But for someone like you or I, 
that create that space to create and that space. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a hard worker, right? right? Like I, I, I'm driving three businesses right now. Some would say sometimes my husband's like, you're working more than you were when you were in corporate America. Yeah. And I'm like, but I'd work 80 hours a week for myself before I'd work 40 hours a week for corporate America ever again. Someone who hasn't been there before might think that when you say you'd work 80 hours for yourself and for someone else, that that's saying, I refuse to let him get my profit from my job. And yes, he's taking a, he or she's taking a risk, but I'm going to do that and I'm going to get all the reward and all that. It's like, no, kind of like besides that, it's like, I'd rather have 80 hours divided by three 20 minute time segments, you know, whatever that is, 240 time segments throughout the week of 20 minutes to work hard, bouncing to what the flow of my system is, rather than doing half of that for somebody else, that would kill me where this other Amen. part is, is invigorating. Amen. And so that you hit the nail on the head. And I think that that's the thing is like, when I'm in my groove, it gives me so much energy and I love what I do that it's not work. Yes. Those 40 hours, even though I enjoyed my job, I still was reporting to someone else who demanded certain everything that I did in my deliverables and there was no creativity. And this, what I'm doing now, it's all mine and I'm in a startup and things are exploding. And like, if I have a sleepless night, it's because I'm so excited right. that I, I like, I'll be up at 3 a.m. just brainstorming and journaling ideas. And I, I love being in that space. It's much better than being in a sleepless space where I was of like the thought of the agonizing thought of not seeing my children for four days because I was going to be on the road. Like, there's, it's a it's a totally different sleeplessness, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's different. So, Melissa, three businesses. Yeah. What are they? Well, I, the, I have two that are in business coaching um, and one in network marketing. So I retired from corporate America, oh, I don't know, about two and a half, almost three years ago. Um, and I know, I know that you've got some skeptics that listen and probably are like, oh, it's one of those things. She came from a pyramid scheme. I was one of those people. I judged network marketing. Um, I wouldn't have even considered it for a number of reasons. Um, and I hope we have a, some time to really get into that. But at the end of the day, in r retrospect now, it is my beloved industry that I highly highly recommend anyone who's considering entrepreneurship. It's a great place to start. Um, it, that's, you know, kind of where I dipped my toe in with absolute low risk um, and learned along the way about entrepreneurship. Um, and from there have spun off um, two other incredible businesses. A little background for the listeners. Melissa, you and I have kind of bounced a little bit back and forth through LinkedIn, commenting on other people's content and so on. And you said, hey, Mike, nice to meet you. Let's connect and so on. And my idea of connection is, would this be an interesting show? And I wasn't sure I'd hear a reply back. <laughs> but I sent back to you. I said, Melissa, I live five miles away from probably the biggest multi-level marketing business Mm -hmm. ever maybe. And I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And mm -hmm. Ada, Michigan is around the corner, you know, 10, mm -hmm. 10 miles away for the headquarters of this huge multi-level marketing business. And I said, I hate multi-level marketing. I hate it because of it. And I hate it for the social reason. And I said, but come on the show and let's talk and just have fun with it. And surprisingly, I got a message back from you that said, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So here we are. So when was your first actual move to get out of corporate America? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So first, I'll, I'll kind of take a step back and say that even in childhood, I was amongst entrepreneurs. I watched um, very strong men in my family grow and build out businesses that were a vision of theirs, that mm -hmm. they were complete startups that went international. So that was all inspiring from childhood up, right? And then somehow I ended up in, in corporate America and big pharma. And then this is family member and friends and that kind of stuff. Yes. My my grandfather, my grandfather had an inter, st started a business in Chicago and, and 
cameras, lenses, actually. Oh. Um, if you think of Walmart or the Kmarts of the day where you could go and get family portraits, he actually created the lens for that so that he, his goal was to make sure his vision was that even um, middle America, middle class America could afford a good portrait. And so he created a lens that could a teenager could snap and get a good portrait. Um, and it went like wildfire. And uh, anyway, so that was his business. But anyway, I had, ser- I had in entrepreneurs, you know, growing up seeing that anything could be possible. Yeah. Um, but I ended up getting my doctorate in pharmacy and went into corporate America and worked for Big, Big Pharma. How long have you been out of school? I've been out of school for about 14 years now. Okay. Yeah. Or did you graduate when you were nine? <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's the nutrition. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but so really, I mean, where the story started for me, because you asked, you know, when did I kind of consider taking that step away from corporate? Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of listeners can probably agree with this or have lived in this, but I was in a place where I, I climbed the corporate ladder super fast. Um, no, no doubt. I was at the top of Mount Everest and looked around as a director and my colleagues were twice my age, right? Like I was definitely a go-getter who sacrificed a lot to get to where I got quickly. What was lacking in the people that you passed? What was lacking in the people that I passed? Um, gosh, that's a great question. I don't, I just have, come on, come on. You know. I, I just have always been one of those people who did things at 110%. You ask me to do something, I do it at 110. That's just always been my personality. Um, so just, they didn't stand out as much to the people that were going to move them up the ladder. Yeah. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, I continued to provide significant value for the corporation, you know? Right. And so they put me through leadership training and I, I went through frontline leadership, second line leadership training and just tearing up to, you know, they were, they were really... Um, getting me ready for a VP role. You were in retail for a while. I did. I did PRN work and retail on weekends around my corporate job before I had kids. So you've been out for 14 years. So you were there within a couple years of graduate. I went straight into pharma from, gra- from grad school, like literally like got my degree and then went to, went to big pharma. What was your goal going to big pharma? Where did you see yourself in 10 years going into that? I thought I was going to go into R and D. I really? did a lot of yeah. I did a lot of rotations on the R and D side. Really fascinated by it. Um, and it's funny how I settled in the medical affairs department because it kind of straddles R and D and the commercial side, right? Yeah. I found out that I liked humans more than I liked rats and data. <laughs> <laughs> So I ended up in medical affairs instead, which was great. It kind of straddled medical yeah. strategy, but was on the forefront of getting into those conversations with thought leaders um, with, in, in certain disease states, you know, that were, yeah. um, it was a really, really cool role. Um, yeah. So I always knew I wanted to be in pharma, even going through pharmacy school. Uh, I went through their master's program in clinical research while doing the doctorate, which really kind of helped propel me into the big pharma world. Gotcha. Um, kind of going through that career track, I really envisioned one day being um, a president of like a big corporation. Even when you were starting in R and D, did did you picture that would be a way up the ladder? For sure, there's presidents in R and D, and it was really I had some really incredible mentors when I was in. I got to rotate through pharma as a as a grad student and really sit in where pharmacists had roles all throughout pharma from pharmacovigilance to competitive, like all kinds of cool stuff. And it gave me a global perspective that with this degree, I could really climb the ranks wherever I wanted to go in this type of industry. If you have the business mindset. And you wanted to be president. Yeah, right. (laughs) So now I am president of my own company, right? (laughs) But if you wanted to be president of the company. Right. I'd imagine you also wanted to be president of the US. (laughs) No. No, come on, really, seriously. No, seriously. You never thought, I'm going to be the president of the U.S. No, no. You wanted to be president of this pharma company, and then would you have just stayed there? Well, see, it's a great question. I wasn't a parent yet. I hadn't gotten into the throes of, of children, and all I'd ever known um, since since really childhood was just, you know, going to the achieving, getting to the next thing. Would you have just said, I'm going to be president of this pharma company, and then that's going to be 
good. Being that in that C-suite role in like senior leadership was as far as my, you know, 30-year-old brain could see at that point. And that would have been a great goal. Like that was a lifelong career track for me. And in corporate America, um, you know, like at GlaxoSmithKline, they have these great leadership programs that really just kind of groom you through the different tiers to get you to the leadership role. And that's kind of the route I was going. Okay. So back to how I got into entrepreneurship to begin with, what, what happened with me was I got to a place where I'd had two children in diapers. I'd climbed this, this Mount Everest and um, got to the top and looked around and realized that I was exhausted. I was trading a significant amount of time for money. I was, for all intents and purposes, other people were raising my children and um, my health was taking a toll. And I think that that is a huge problem in the US as we work way too many hours and don't make a priority to take care of ourselves. And it's this vicious cycle of not making priority for health and wellness Um, and And so I um, coincidentally did a lot of research on, because I've always been really big in nutrition and fitness and, you know, done triathlons, Olympic distance, marathons, you name it. Melissa, before you go into this other avenue, how far did you climb on your first goal? I covered half the country. Um, I had 12 reports. The only person above me was the VP of our division. Were you at a point on the ladder where the presidency of the company was no longer in reach? Oh, like I couldn't be president? Actually, quite the opposite. (laughs) I was actually being um, approached about taking a VP role. The VP role would have had you real close to the presidency role, potentially of that or another company. For full disclosure, I'd actually left one company who offered me the national VP role and I did not want it, okay? Gotcha. So I, I'm not one, I'm definitely not down and trodden and like didn't reach my goals because they weren't attainable. I actually got really crystal clear on my priorities in life and what was most important. You could have been inside feeling terrible at the presidency in another like three years somewhere. Exactly. Well, and I think that we all grow as we go through our professions. And this is why I think like coaches, mentors are so important. Luckily for me at Glaxo, I had some of the most amazing mentors that I still keep close to my heart and to my phone. And I'll never forget being on maternity leave um, with my second child and being approached about a leadership role that the the company wanted me to to interview for. And I consulted my mentor and he gave me me some of the best advice that I I stuck to throughout my corporate career. And that was, look, because my fear was if I pass this up, they won't come back to me. If I pass this up, they'll think I don't want it. They'll think I'm, you know, slacking, whatever. But I knew that I knew that I knew that I didn't want to come back to work with two kids in diapers and cover, you know, half the country at that time as a director on on airplanes. But I was still a go-getter who wanted to drive my career. Um, And my mentor said, Melissa, as long as you continue to show up and continue to perform the way you're performing, you call the shots. You need to decide what's most important for your family and what is going to keep your nucleus at home happy um, and continue to perform. And these opportunities will continue to come your way. And you just have to continue to reassess where you are and if it's the right timing. Was that a mentor at the company or, or on your own somewhere? It was a mentor at the company. Yeah. Were there a lot of people at your level or above that you said, how the hell are they in that spot? You know, it's funny. There were some, but I have to look back at GlaxoSmithKline who like raised me. And some of the most amazing humans that I know to this day came out of there. Some of the dearest friends. There are certainly some people you kind of question how they got where they got. Um, But in general, just an amazing group of, of people. That's a good answer because you've already said the name of the company. If I were to ask you <laughs> the name of a different company, you'd say, yeah, Glaxo's a lot different, but at 99% of the others, there's a bunch. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a head scratcher. Right, right. You did a good job on that. Some of my closest friends to this day that are business partners now in my new business are like from their the dearest of uh, teammates, colleagues, employees um, there. How long between, and please go there, which you were going to, about your love of the nutrition and so on. How long before those thoughts 
and then the time that you left? Was that a, a, a year span or a three-year span or a month span or whatever? I'll tell you when the thought started to percolate in my mind was when I was still at Glaxo and my division of 72, 12 directors, 72 educators and yeah, 12, yeah. We were told over Christmas that our division would be consolidating. Mm. And at that time, again, I had two kids in diapers right? and I covered just North Carolina and Virginia. And for those of your listeners who are, you know, in kind of a territory based role, you would know that I had uh, some local employees that I could work with during the day and be home at night. Yeah. And my travel was fairly local, right? Sure. Right. So that was over Christmas. And uh, on the uh, two or three weeks before Christmas, they announced to us, they were consolidating our division from 72 to 25. And instead of 12 directors, there would be two. And that we would find out in a couple of weeks through a phone call whether we still had a job or not. Wow. And that was terrifying because here I had spent, you know, grueling yeah. time and hours going through all their leadership development, giving them all my blood, sweat, and tears in overtime, right? right. Um, and it was the first time, you know, up until that point, you know, I thought it was kind of invincible. You come out of pharmacy school, you get this big salary, you know, I've got this company car, the perks are great, I've got a pension. And all of a sudden, you know, the rug gets ripped out from under you and you realize, and this kind of goes back to our original discussion of the gig thing, right? I have, this was my one stream of income. I'm the yeah. primary breadwinner. I still yeah. have over $100,000 of college loan debt to pay off. Yeah. Um, and my corporation is deciding in the next two weeks whether they value me enough to keep me or not. Right. Um, lucky for me, you know, my, my VP came to me and was like, look, you know, we've put you through all these leadership programs. You are like our golden child. We're, we're keeping you, but you need to know that you'll be covering New York to Maine and you'll have half the country. Either way, you're damned. I mean, you either lose your job or, or you have a job that's not feasible with your family, or practical. Exactly, Mike. So in a matter of 24 hours... I realized I had financial success, but no financial freedom. Mm -hmm. And I had no time freedom. And in a matter of weeks, I was gonna to be told that I was gonna to have to be on an airplane four to five days a week. Wow. And I, I had already seen my, my mother have to take my two-year-old to the ER for pneumonia because I was in Maryland for a meeting during that time. And the mom guilt really starts to settle in that I didn't think about before I had kids. Like that, that wasn't part of our equation before kids, right? Right. So that was the point, back to your question, I didn't know what the solution was going to be. But I remember thinking to myself, losing sleepless nights asking myself, praying to God, what can I do right now? Because I have gotten myself, I've pigeonholed myself into this high salary. My family depends on it. And I've, I've climbed myself into this, this, this mountain. And now I don't, I don't feel like I have options. I don't feel like I have control unless I want to leave this and go find a, a retail role somewhere. And for me, that was like, like a pay cut and that was like half my salary to come back to retail um, and find a job, right? Doing something I wasn't really passionate about. I loved what I was doing. It yeah. was the time constraint. So that was the moment that I realized I feel, I feel helpless right now and out of control and I'll never let this happen again. I've got to come up with a game plan. And I remember my boss, who again, a dear friend of mine to this day, I speak lovingly of my GSK family, even though I chose to leave. He told, I decided to leave. I found a different opportunity with another company that was starting up a division very similar to what we had created at Glaxo over five years and I had helped develop it. They hired me in to start up something very similar with a competitor, AstraZeneca, um, to do something similar. And I was able to get back down to two states, have 12 reports, most of them local. And so I go back to that mentorship guidance who said, you know, choose what suits you and your family right now, right? Yeah. The opportunities will continue to come. So I declined on that half the country role that would probably give me more stripes and a feather in my hat to something different. And I'll never forget my VP who had invested so much in me and training for me and kind of grooming me. He looked at me and he said, you know, I have to be honest. And I, this is behind closed doors. Like I'm so jealous 
that you have the freedom to just walk away right now. He said, you are young enough with this company that, you know, he's like, I've got so much invested in my pension, all this stuff, all this baggage. Yes. All the, all the golden handcuff baggage. He said, I can't leave. And you get to go recreate yourself. He said, Melissa, you're going to look back on this and it will be one of the biggest turning points and trajectory for your career. And you will, you don't know it now. And he was like a fatherly figure. You know, he said, you don't know it now. That was the first step in being bold and recognizing that like I have full Um, control of my destiny, that there's a million ways to Sunday to make a million dollars. And it's not just with this company, right? Right. So that opened my mind. During that time, is it fair to say that anxiety was the top feeling you were having? I was super anxious, sleepless. I can distinctly remember laying in the bed, trying to figure out who was going to watch our children while I was gone and thinking about everything I was going to be missing. Like I could cry about it right now Um, and feeling completely out of control and helpless, like desperately, just like I've got to, I've got to find, I've got to find something else. This is not going to work for us. That moment I'll never forget. And the second one, which may sound like, oh, woe is me, but it's, it's true. And, and at every level and every income people, you know, have to buy a home. They, have certain finances that they have to meet. My husband and I had just the day before signed on the construction of a new home, a new custom home, 24 hours before this was announced. And I'll never forget my husband, I'll never forget him like trying to chase me down the next day and be like, the builders need you to look at these windows, check this certain whatever fixture out for the new home. And I remember responding to him with, how can you be thinking about this house when I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this career? You know, like it was just so just... Because you had to be questioning whether you could continue with the house or... I was. Yeah. I wanted to pull the plug. Your husband didn't pick up on no, that. No, without a shadow of a doubt. He's like, no, we're, you're going to be fine. We're moving on. During that couple of days, week and so on, when did you finally get a glimpse of saying, I can do this? Was it when the other company called? It was like so serendipitous. Like literally within 48 hours of the announcements with our company, I got a phone call from a headhunter. Wow from AstraZeneca. So I didn't even look for the job. They they came and found me. Did they know that you were going to be downsized? They must have. They must have to this day. I mean, because it was a very specific solicitation. They needed someone to come in and help build out a new respiratory care educator division, just like GSK was consolidating. And the reason GSK was consolidating it was because he didn't have the funds for it anymore. So they they cut it out and AstraZeneca wanted to blow it up. So they might not have known exactly your position, but they knew that it was there was going to be a, a shrink and an expansion somewhere in there. Yes. And for all your listeners who are considering a job jump, I mean, this is in, great advice for anyone. I mean, you, you want to raise and pay, leave one corporation and, and go to another because... They, you know, as great as GSK was at raising me, they brought me in and at an entry level of where I was. And over time, you know, I got promotions. It was great. I felt like I was well compensated. The moment I jumped to another company, I got a $50,000 raise. The last year or so, it's been coming to me for some reason. I'm not sure how I've been watching it, but basically it said nowadays to get your highest increase, you've got to switch a company yeah. because the anchor's already set at the other one and you're going to always be looking off of that and you got to go where there's a new anchor and that's the advice. So you're lining up with what the, rea- you know, your, your reality is what the current advice is, it seems. I just began to realize the value of my knowledge, you know, outside of the set value for this one corporation that raised me. So how long did you stay there for? I stayed there for about three years, but that was actually the same time when I took that job. I also, that was the moment a really good friend reached out to me about Isogenics and she was reaching out to me about the nutrition and the business model. At that time, I was still uber, uber, uber skeptical of anything affiliated with what people historically call MLMs, right? Got Gotcha. So when she came to me, I actually was 100% interested in nutrition because I'd done some research. And you know how like, 
when you go through something like that life shaking, it's like, okay, it's time to put my oxygen mask on and get myself together. And like, really just, it was just one of those moments. And I've talked to a lot of people who've left one company and gone to another. And it's like, this moment of like revitalization and just resetting, right? And so yeah. I was like, you know what? Like I just, I, I had like a good like 10 or 12 week window that I was taking from one corporation to the next. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go in on this nutritional rebalancing thing. I, I don't wanna hear anything you have to say about the business because I make plenty of money and I've got way too much knowledge to look into one of those things. But I've done a lot of research on your products and I actually really love the science behind them. So give, you know, let's get me started. So that's how I started. And I, I started on these products and about just within days, you talk about just going from a three to a 10. I mean, my overall well-being, my energy levels, just everything started to operate on a better level. Um, and through the over a period of 30 days, um, just a massive transformation physically, energetically, I lost about six inches in my waist and I wasn't, I wasn't a fat or overweight person. It was just kind of this visceral toxic crap that we accumulate over a and lifetime. Cortisol build. Exactly. Cortisol belly. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so coincidentally, my cortisol levels started to drop and I was sleeping better. But Melissa, devil's advocate, you just left a job with the stress too, right? And that's part of it. Yes. It was perfect timing for me. Yeah, for sure. So I went on the journey with the products, loved them. Um, you know, I knew, and I knew skeptically, mm -hmm. extremely skeptically. I mean, keep in mind, I'm like, medical scientist liaison, talk about people who look at data who are super critical. But I was still skeptically, there was something that made me curious about the business because I saw these other women within the organization who had who came from these really highly coveted corporate careers and were now, uh, you know, building uh, an asset. And I thought they were crazy. I thought, I thought they were crazy. But there was this little piece of me that was a little bit jealous that sure. Here I loved these products and I was about to get back on an airplane and start another career with another company. And these women who had introduced me to these products were running a business from home, making just as much money as I was about to getting on airplanes and, you know, and, and getting back into my corporate gig. So for me, it was kind of a slow process because I begrudgingly like was like, mm, no, like I, I'm not doing one of those things. I'm like, I didn't want people to think I was affiliated. I didn't want to sell my friends. I didn't want to sell my family. I don't want people to run for me. Like that's all I thought of, right? But, you know, when I got the results and people started asking me, what is it you're doing? You're just, you're glowing, right? Um, yeah, you could say, well, you left one career and went to another. But the reality is the sequential people in my life, including my husband who hadn't had a career change, as I introduced them to the products and I watched my husband drop 25 pounds in a month and a half, right? And I see people with chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. I get their nutrition right and I'm seeing massive changes with them, massive. I started to get really excited, really excited about the impact I was making on other people's health and on their lives. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was word of mouth. I was just coincidentally sharing about something I loved, right? Um, and changing people's lives. But over time, it took time for me to actually be open to the fact that this was a legitimate business that could be leveraged to, to grow and scale and build, not just in the US, but in 18 countries globally, right? Um, and so it didn't happen for me overnight. But what happened for me over a period of two or three months was that I got into the best health of my life. I can tell you five years in, I ran seven miles yesterday. Um, you know, I'm 40 and I've got three kids now. Um, and I'm, you know, a walking, talking billboard of the nutrition. But I was able to, to grow and scale this business online while I was working full time on the airplane, you know, in, in my hotel. Um, I leaned in and learned the business model. I checked my ego at the door. That was a lot of self work because it's funny. I think back to your first message of like, well, maybe this could be a fun banter back and forth because of yeah. the perceived perception of network marketing. Um, but I actually, and I actually had to do my own self work on that. You, I don't know if you know this, Mike, but I was actually, 
I was making six figures in isogenics and still working my corporate job for fear of what people like you would think, Ah. right? My network would think of me walking away from this like shiny coveted career with the fancy titles. And I had to hire a life coach to help me work through that mindset of like, no, 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 no. Like you've got your priorities straight. You have built a business that is a, by your lifestyle design around your family that's providing significantly for them. Why are you worried about what the rest of the world thinks? Right? Melissa, your fear was losing the reputable yeah. title. Yeah. Imagine this sitting at the Christmas dinner table and people are like, oh, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I'm a medical science liaison director and I have PhDs and MDs that report to me. Oh, tell me more about that, right? Yeah. Right. And then you sit down at dinner and people are like, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I'm a network marketer. And they're like, ooh, <laughs> people run from you, right? So, but now when you offered to bring me on to your podcast today, like that mind shift for me has changed tremendously. And yeah. I have this ridiculous passion now and mission to professionalize the industry. And it actually is unfortunate that so many professionals perceive it the way they do and are not open to the actual asset and opportunity it could afford them if they were open to it. And so that kind of has kind of segment weighed me into the businesses I run now and my presence online on LinkedIn and the professionals that I'm recruiting in that are growing and scaling massive businesses through e-commerce online. All right, so Melissa, yes. when I was like 14, and I've got 11 brothers and sisters. Oh, wow. You have 11 brothers and sisters? Yeah. Wow. And we were on vacation at Empire, Michigan, which is on Lake Michigan. And my little sisters would come into the house and they'd have a rock sale selling the rocks that they found out on the on the beach. Right. My kids do that today in the cul-de-sac. <laughs> yeah, a rock sale. So they'd come into the cottage and I was smart enough there to say, this is this is a scam that my little sisters are playing on the adults here. Right, right. You know, they'd price them at a couple pennies, a dime maybe. But it's when they would get up to like two bucks and they'd say, this is $2. And you're like, well, what do you got for a penny? You know, I knew there was some tension there that this wasn't an actual sale. They're using their relationship of being a daughter and so on with the family. So take all the multi-level marketing stuff, all the lawsuits from the past and so on and the business structure. And I have no problem with that because as independent pharmacists, we're in a crappy business structure. If people saw our business structure, they'd say, I was talking to one of my um, guests before, and he said he won't even sell his pharmacy to somebody because it's that (laughs) terrible that he won't put someone in that position of going bankrupt in a year. Okay. Right. So put put all of those conversations behind. Here's the one issue that has bothered me about multi-level marketing in the past. And I've, and I saw something on yours that I kind of like though, but here's what's bothered me in the past is, Hey, can I stop by and, and all the things you've heard before? Hey, I'm a business owner now. It's like, well, yeah, I'm a business owner too, but they want to start you off in the business or less. They just want to let's catch up the bait and switch, the bait and switch. And It kind of reminded me of the rock sale a little bit, the bait and switch. But at least they came right out and said, I'm selling rocks for $5. Right, right, right. And I said, not not to me. I'm smart enough, even as a 12-year-old, to know those aren't worth $5. Right. But it's that bait and switch. And like at the pharmacy, thankfully, I don't have to sell to any family to be successful. I'm happy if family comes there or friends, but I don't have to do it to be successful. Right. And – I've been baited and switched on before for multi-level marketing. But what I like about your stuff is I've seen on LinkedIn, I I see right where you have very nice, what would you call them? Not memes. What's the word for like a little ad? I want to call it an ad, but you're going to get all over me because I didn't even know what the hell a gig was. So now (laughs) you're going to say, oh, Mike, that's not an ad. That's a a social media banner. What are you doing? You know? (laughs) 
you know. Are you just talking about little flyers? No, just like, you know, the things that you had that said, I'm going to teach you about social selling. Oh, you know, I thought that's really cool. You know, that Melissa has social selling and that's, that's a lot different than, hey, Mike, I haven't seen you in 10 years, you know. Right. That's slimy. Here's why I know those don't work for me because nobody cares to see me that much. (laughs) You know, but I liked seeing that social selling. That was really cool to see how it's like, yeah. well, no, I'm look on my Facebook or whatever. I have social selling. So obviously I'm not going to do a bait and switch. I want to, I want you to learn about this. I'm sure that was an issue for you. And I'm sure that's an industry issue. And what's the whole story on that? Or, or what's the end of the story on that? Oh my gosh. It's such a great question. And I do think that it's been an evolving industry. And I think that right now we are in a new decade. It is a business Mm. of the 21st century where technology, I go back to that ability to network, connect and build a business from home has never been easier, right? Um, And so first and foremost, I wanna recognize and acknowledge the history of, of some of the MLMs and the trouble they've gotten in and the feeling that some bad network marketers to this day can make you feel like when they're doing it improperly and chasing after you and trying to sell yeah. your friends and family. And that is the number one reason I didn't want to get started in the first place because I had this like icky negative connotation for an industry I actually knew nothing about, but it was an emotion that was elicited when even it was brought up, right? Sure. Um, But when I got in the throes of it and realized and learned the, just the incredibleness of the product line and started to learn the power of if something's results oriented and emotional, there's no better way to spread it than through word of mouth, right? But I agree with you 100% that the bait and switch to this day drives me crazy, which is why I love LinkedIn. And I don't build my business on Facebook or Instagram. My friends and family are on Facebook and Instagram. That's where I connect with them. I follow them. They get to see my kids playing in the backyard and the garden that I'm growing. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, network marketing is a business through word of mouth. And what I have found is that there's there's two different consumer types, right? And I think where companies get in trouble, like the one that you've talked about being in your backyard, is where companies just 100% lead with a, a business and there's not like an end game. Like you, the, the, the business is the number one thing sold, not the product. I live, like I say, 10 miles away from this place. I have never used one of their products. Not on purpose. I've, you, you know the story. Right. I've never, I've never seen yeah. a product at some house. I've never, right. I've never used it. I've never had anybody tell me about it. Never. Right. It's because that's the old adage. It's the old MLM perspective. It's the old MLM model, which is not network marketing. It's this is a business that has come of age and a time where technology and where people are influenced is online. It's not, it's not belly to belly. It's, it's not, um, with your, it's a totally different platform. Belly to belly. You know, like, you know, like your neighbor, um, versus using the, you being on the internet. I just wish you'd keep belly out of this. I'm quite tender about that subject. <laughs> okay. So, so let's, so let's talk about this. So, um, what I love about LinkedIn and why it's my sweet spot and why I've been so successful is because I treat my business like the income opportunity that it is on the right platform where people are looking for an opportunity, right? I'm not, I'm not chasing my neighbors and my, my family to get into a business with me when they never expressed an interest in being in the business with me, right? But if they complain about the quarantine 15, I might suggest they want to try a 30 day system and we can reboot their body. But I'm, you know, but it's kind of like the old, uh, one of my top mentors in my industry used to be a salon owner. 
And she said where network marketers get a bad rap is where you ha- she uses her salon as an example. If you had a client come in and sit down to get their hair cut and they're getting their hair cut and you say to them, gosh, you know, you love getting your hair cut so much. Have you ever thought about coming into business with me and cutting hair? And it's like, no, I just wanted a haircut, but thanks. And you walk away feeling like dirty, right? That's kind of that bait and switch old kind of mentality of MLMs. Um, What I do in my business is I have an online e-commerce franchise. I teach people how to set up a global business from home. It's a health and wellness one-stop online store, right? And, you know, there is a business model, but the thing is 87% of the consumers with our company, with Isagenics, are consumers, just that. The complete opposite of what you see with your older MLMs who don't have a foundational like um, blockbuster product that really shot the company, you know, out into the stratosphere. Our company was founded on product, not business model. Our company was founded on intermittent fasting and nutritional cleansing, which by the way, was published in what the new it's everywhere now, but even in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, really, really validated what we've been doing for 18 years, right? So, you know, our company found it on product and said, we're going to get this right, we're going to create a ridiculously amazing product line that absolutely drives results, the best place to grow and scale a product, especially nutrition and wellness that's results oriented is through word of mouth. Because people trust the results that they see from the people that they know, right? Um, And so it's a phenomenal business model when you're in nutrition and health and really beauty. Um, And so it's actually a brilliant business model that the company went that direction. But where I wanted to go with just talking about the business model itself is that, you know, LinkedIn is a is a great platform where I go and find business partners who want to build an online franchise, I can teach them how to build a turnkey business and lock arms with me. And of course, we also are, you know, the end product of any business are consumers. So I have a number of functional medicine, you know, pharmacists who've got functional medicine degrees. I've got consulting pharmacists. I have physical therapists, chiropractors who came in, love the products, love the science behind it, can get behind it 100% because they know the quality process. They know it's third party validated. They know they can offer it without a shadow of a doubt to their clients, their customers, and drive incredible results, right? And I go back to your business model with the pharmacy, right? And, you know, how we traditionally think about making money with a bricks and mortar and the amount of investment that goes into owning a bricks and mortar business, right? And nine out of 10 businesses fail. And so I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw, talk about the elephant in the room because I get this from smart, savvy business people sometimes. They'll say, well, I've looked at the numbers in your company. And, you know, only a small percentage succeed. And I'm like, have you looked at the numbers in entrepreneurship in general? Have you looked at the numbers of businesses that fail from the beginning? There's a lot of different variables that are going to determine your success. In some MLMs, it's in the past and maybe even now, if you get some Mm -hmm. that are not reputable, it can be quite low. But they're usually comparing that to saying, if you were to take that money and just put it in, well, you know, and they usually say something safe, you know, like education safe or, or something like that. But to your point, correct. They're not saying if you were to take that money and instead of doing it this way, you know, you put it into, um, <laughs> right, you know, right. you opened up a restaurant slash movie theater in January of 2020. <laughs> you know, I mean... You're not comparing it to something, a business, so much as to if you were to put it somewhere safe, but that's not what a lot of people really want to do. Right. Well, so two things here, here, and I love, and that's why I love bringing this out on the table because my perspective and my experience, there's two variables to success rate in network marketing, um, which is different than the multi level where people who come in first are the ones that make all the money. That is not how most up-to-date compensation models work. Our, our company is only 18 years old. It's very different than a company that didn't have supercomputers to rely on a fair and balanced 
um, comp model no matter when you come into the business, right? Um, but there's two reasons people, from my perspective and what I've seen in my five years, there's two reasons people don't succeed, right? So the, the number one is just like, like I said, with the odds of entrepreneurship and success rate, the nine out of 10 fail, but really it has to do with how people approach the opportunity. See, what I have found is historically people think of this business model as a get rich quick scheme. They think they can do little effort and find a one hit wonder and make a ton of money. And right. that's unfortunate because it's been it's been socialized that way by bad multi-level marketers. Yeah, the yacht and those kind of things. Right. Right. You have you have to do the work. I'm here to tell you, can you cuss on this podcast? Maybe not. I work my fanny. You want to drop a F bomb? No, what well, an A bomb. Yeah. So I You can say that. Okay. So I Let her rip. I worked my ass off to build an income producing asset that now pays me out every single week, whether I show up or not. Right. It was not a get rich quick scheme. I built a network of over 5,000 of mass consumption of a reorder rate of 87% because people love the product because the product drives results and the company gives me a 6% profit share because they don't have a middleman, they don't have a bricks and mortar, they don't have utilities, they don't have sales clerks checking people out to purchase the products. They're right. online. I've been able to give this network of consumption, right? But where I was going with that is that I did the work. And I think that a lot of people come into this thinking it's get rich quick, so that was the number one. But then the number two is that they actually don't put forth the, the effort that is needed to drive a six figure, multiple six figure income. You know, I have people who come in and they're like, yeah, I want to, I want to walk away from corporate America and do what you did, Melissa. And I'm like, okay, great. So we start the coaching and you know, they reach out to their first three people on LinkedIn who may be interested in the business model and they get a no. And they're like, oh, I, I, it's, it, this isn't going to work for me. It's not for me. The business model doesn't work, right? Like they get two or three failures um, and they say it, it doesn't work or they expect a massive amount of money overnight. And that's not the way this business model works. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the way it works. But once you build it, you get paid for a lifetime. It's like a freight train that I think that many who don't get that. Have you read the Robert Kiyosaki books? I'm sure you have. Rich dad, poor dad, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, those cash flow quadrants, you know, I think about when I was in corporate America and even when you're self-employed and you own that pharmacy, man, you got to show up to get that money, right? You got to show up in corporate America to get paid. And when I went on maternity leave after six weeks, I didn't get a penny, right? Right. The company didn't matter how many people I trained and how much business the company was profiting because of my coaching or the impact I made. I wasn't there that day, so I didn't get paid, right? Yeah, right. That's linear pay. And what I love and have fallen in love with, with this business model, is that leverage and residual. And it's so different than my corporate job where I did do the work. I've, I've brought in over 250 people to Isogenics. And out of those 250 people, we now have 5,000 in our organization. And that's because out of those 250, it's been introduced to 5,000 more people, right? And so what happens in that right side of the quadrant with Robert Kiyosaki, who talks about residual, that legacy money, is that you make money while you sleep. And when I was in corporate America, I thought that was like, you have to have a one hit wonder. You have to like write a song or do something I wasn't qualified to do in order to get paid out residually until I was able to check my ego at the door and actually learn the business model. Once, Mike, once I finally understood the power of leverage, once I understood that once I got a network of mass consumption for a product that, by the way, I love, that I stand behind, right, that it would pay me out as an asset for the rest of my life, yeah. whether I showed up or not, I was, that's when you, you could have put a brick wall in front of me and I would have gone through it, which I did to make it happen. I like how you still associate with multi-level marketing, the words, 
Mm-hmm. I like how you associate with social social marketing. I think where some of the companies have gotten in trouble in the past and using the dreaded pyramid scheme notation is that there was no or very little product involved where right. almost all of the money was from business startups, fees, those kind of things. So to hear about product flow pulls yeah. it very far away from anything else but just a product the multi-level right. marketing and then with the underlings of that being either social or or whatever. Well, you know, you hit on something I'd love to just kind of circle back to for a quick second um, that's really important. And that is, you know, historically there's, and even today, there's companies that say, oh, you've got to, you've got to invest thousands. You've got to front load and have a ton of products. You've got to buy a ton of this stuff and keep it in your house. And that's front loading the business model and setting people up for failure. You know, um, our company and many state of the art network marketing companies, we have a policy, you're a customer first. The only barrier to entry with our business is you eat the food, you try the products. There's no purchasing, you know, a ton of product for future consumers. Like you literally order what you can eat this month and give the products a whirl. And that actually, introduces you to to joining our company and our culture. If you decide to build a business, great. If you don't, there's still an 87% chance you're gonna keep ordering it because it's a redirected spend to something that you you had in your pantry anyway, but now it's driving better health results for you. And the other thing I wanted to hit on real quickly that you brought up that's a great hot, hot topic is the pyramid, right? the pyramid, the dreaded pyramid where people at the top make all the money. And um, that that historically has been true with companies that have gone to court and been in lawsuits about because the, it, historically companies have created compensation structures that ultimately the people at the top make the most money because the people at the bottom have, they have these breakaway models where they can only make so much money and they roll up somewhere. And there's all these crazy rules where ultimately the, the volume gets flushed out and only the people at the top do make the money. That's They say the the, the house, it's stacked, the cards are stacked for the, to the house. house. Right. That gets companies in trouble. You know, the more, the more state of the art, newer network marketing companies acutely aware of that. You know, with our company, we have a binary compensation model, which means it doesn't matter when or who or how you come in. Every single person has the same equal opportunity to build the exact same business center, no matter what. And, um, that's that's because of the advent, I personally think, because of the technology and supercomputers that are able to just constantly be able to calculate that kind of stuff. Um, but the pyramid. So let's go back to my corporate days. Okay. And let's think about that HR structure that was depicted lovingly as a pyramid. And my boss always was in a pay grade higher than me. Always. When he had that title, no matter how hard I worked, he always made more money than me. My direct reports were below me. They always, there's no way they could make more money than me. It was a ceiling. It was capped. This was their title. This is what they could make. They had less vacation. My boss had more. That's just the way it was. It was a pyramid, right? I came from the pyramid. I came into a company that was 18 years old. So I'm not first to market. I'm not one of the first people in. And I flew past thousands of people in the organization to become one of the top income earners, which first of all debunks that the people that came in in the beginning had to make the money. Right. But secondly, we have an unlimited income earning. And to some that's like mind blowing, but to me it's fair. It is a, it's a, it's a mathematical equation and it's based off the volume that runs through your business center. It doesn't matter your credentials. If you have a doctorate or you're a hairstylist, right? If you're building out a business of mass consumption, regardless, the computer system recognizes that and gives you a profit share of 6%. And so what I love about our business model is there is no pyramid. It is a flat ball game. And so I'm just on a mission for the next probably 20 years of my, my career as a professional network marketer to educate people 
of my love for this industry and debunk the myths of, of the baggage of the old days, right? The baggage of the old days is hard to escape, but thankfully with the quick access to the internet, stories can change quickly for the bad, but also for the good. Right. So Melissa, you've talked about the network marketing. I'm assuming one of the coaching hats you wear is in that. I might be wrong. Is And then is the second one related to, do these form a group or is, or is the second one out there somewhere else? Ah, oh, great question. It's kind of, I've become a serial entrepreneur. Um, and it all started really with my corporate life and the training I got in corporate life of really how to grow and scale a team, how to be organized with training, you know, and onboarding and duplicating because I was constantly bringing in new employees and we had to have a streamlined process to onboard and educate, certify, put people out in the field to be experts, right? And then managing nationally a geodispersed team, right? So yeah, it's incredible when you think back the storyline and how it tees you up to be successful in like the next, the next phase, right? Um, but so for me, what I found was that I, unlike a 99% of network marketers, um, I do not like posting and pushing a product on a platform like Instagram or Facebook, because that's not what that platform is for. And um, being a business professional, I really enjoy talking about business. I like talking about cash flow quadrants and Robert Kiyosaki. And um, I like talking business. I like talking about an opportunity. And so unlike many of even my leaders in my organization, I, I kind of went a hard right from like, have you ever read the blue ocean, the book, the blue ocean? No. Um, okay. It's a great read, but it talks about like the red ocean is where everybody's doing the same thing in the same market and competing, doing the same thing and trying to be, you know, differentiate themselves. And that's network marketing and Instagram and Facebook. I created a blue ocean for myself, took a hard right to LinkedIn and said, look, I'm leading with a, I'm I, as incredible as this product is, I want to find my business partners and future business partners, partners on LinkedIn, because these people who are active on this platform are looking for something. They're open, right? And so it's the right platform to be communicating and connecting with people about a business opportunity versus chasing your friends and family. And so that exploded my business in network marketing and I've created a formula and given my background in corporate and training, I was able to partner um, with some Kajabi export experts and actually create a training program for my team on how to best network on LinkedIn and to best um, create your best personal brand on LinkedIn um, and how to network and recruit for the business opportunity on LinkedIn. And so that was initially just for my team. I did it just for my team so that we could duplicate it out yeah. um, and bring in as new people came in, it was a way to train. It was an asset to say, hey, you know, we've got this turnkey training program. You learn as you go, we'll get you out and you can start building your business. What I quickly found is that it wasn't just me and it wasn't just my team. There's a lot of really polished professional professionals who also have a network marketing business that aren't in my company. So I started, I, I joined a mastermind of women entrepreneurs who are top income earners for other network marketing companies that are attorneys, that are law, that are um, doctors, that are dentists, that also have those side gigs in network marketing that are aligned to a product that they love. And they were very curious about how I was able to find my business partners on LinkedIn because they'd never heard of taking that approach. Really? Um, even though they were business professionals by day, they were still being those spammy network marketers on Facebook and Instagram by night, right? It seems intuitive for, I guess, I've been LinkedIn forever, but a lot of the people you, you look and a lot of the professions aren't even on there. Right. So one of the dermatologists on my Isogenics team who has a podcast, by the way, Millennial Doc, she 
um, I'm coaching her now. She had been recruiting on Instagram and she, we went, we got her on LinkedIn and she was, I was like, she had like five people in her network. I'm like, what are you doing? Dr. Nicoletta, you should be over here networking with your other professional millennial doctors who are looking for a secondary income stream, a a plan B, a way to create leverage. And and that's a conversation you can have on this platform without turning people off because it's the right platform. The long and the short of it is I ended up opening it up to, um, at first, other social sellers uh, with other companies. And that that grew like wildfire to um, a real formalized LinkedIn bootcamp course that I offer um, about once every six weeks. My next one is June 22nd, um, where I train anyone in social selling really how to build out their personal brand on LinkedIn to create that know, like, and trust. Like you probably felt like you knew me a little bit before we got on on here because of my LinkedIn strategies um, so that people know who I am, that right. you know who I am. I am who I am. That snowballed into um, higher end clients who wanted one-on-one coaching to really get their business up to snuff, their brand representation on LinkedIn. Now I have, um, it's stemmed out to financial advisors. So I've got a whole firm that um, I had an owner present to me. He said, you know, my my financial advisors know their numbers. They're great with their business, but they need to be trained on how to get out there and find their clients on the right platform because that's where I said in the beginning, like the way we do business has changed. It is the business of the 21st century to be on media. You are leveraging and branding yourself, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, the average American spends four and a half hours on the platform. Right. So if you're not creating no like and trust factor on in a feed where you're looking for clients, it's gonna the sales cycle to bring people in is gonna take you a tremendously longer amount of time. So now I'm helping financial advisors on creating their own personal brand and creating their own you know, no like and trust factor and how to find ideal clients, how to attract ideal clients. Same with real estate agents. People who are really focused on development and growth, I have found most, you're going to find them on LinkedIn, right? They're not scrolling for three hours on Instagram because they see that as a waste of time. So that's where my business is have really, it's really sprung board into LinkedIn training for social sellers is one. Um, I have a totally uh, second tier mastermind for people who graduate from my basic LinkedIn bootcamp and it's application only. I only take a certain number of clients per month and teach them even uh, further develop their branding techniques, their booking techniques, automation. Um, So that's more of a mastermind group. And then I have individual one-on-one high-end clients that get me to themselves to help them drive their personal brand. Let's say that nobody was going to show you the money on this. And they said, we're going to hide that from you, Melissa, but just trust us. It's all going to work out in the end. How much time would you like to spend in a week on this new coaching outside of your product versus with your base people. Now, I know the answer is like, well, yeah, but we need to do this to get the residual, you know, to get the the residual income, but I'm not talking about that. Which one do you like more? Oh, that is a, oh, you asked the best questions. And it's funny you ask that because I've actually created my coaching so that my LinkedIn bootcamp that I offer every six weeks, which I love, by the way, is designed so that my entire team is able to fold in anyone that they bring in to my training. Um, so it's actually, you know, an added benefit to joining my team is that you get this LinkedIn bootcamp training for free. Um, essentially, well, you, you eat the isogenics food, right? Because that's what gets you into the business. Um, so I'm actually, it's, I'm killing two birds with one stone and it's really kind of cool because in any given class, I may have 30 people from my own team and 75 from other network marketing companies who are professionals who are looking to professionalize and polish how they present themselves on LinkedIn. And so it's a cross pollinization think tank of professionals who really want to professionalize this industry 
in one forum and they learn from each other. Um, they learn best practices from each other. And it actually, when I take you back to that Melissa Henault three years ago, who was so anxious about walking away from corporate America for fear of what other people would think, this community allows my students to be bulletproof and 10 foot tall in their decision because they're surrounded by other mm. professionals who've chosen this industry. So it helps create this cohesive momentum regardless of what network marketing company you're, you're from. Now, did I hear you correctly, though, that you've got your other one goes into not they're not necessarily multi-level marketers or network marketers. They're attorneys trying to get more attorney clients just right. for their attorney business, right? Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Do you like doing that or do you say, no, they're boring? I have more fun, I think, um, with the social selling aspect because it's the sweet spot of like, because I like... Um, I like coaching this, the real strategy of recruitment for network marketing. So I would say, but there's one of my favorite spots to be is I right before you or actually two hours before you was a one-on-one a -on -one coaching call with two Wall Street walkouts. So they left Wall Street um, and they're building an isogenics business. They're not on my team and they're paying me a pretty penny to coach them for an hour each week on how to leverage LinkedIn to recruit their professional network. Those people that just, they're so coachable, they're so motivated, um, they're really fun to coach too, you know? But I I like coaching the underdog too to help them get started, you know? I bet it's fun to do that because also you're not dealing with a lot of the bitterness that goes along with really mature industries, mm -hmm. which brings me into another question for you. A good portion of the listeners of the podcast are independent pharmacy owners, mm -hmm. amongst other people, but a good portion are those. Yep. And we all do our social media and, and those kind of things. But it's not the usual course where you're sitting there on Christmas Eve with your family, and you might bring up something about how your nutrition's feeling good or about how this or this or that. But most people just don't bring up that, oh, did I tell you about this pharmacy I've been going to for 20 years that I like and you maybe should give it a try? Right. Besides, this is really dirty of me. What? Because here you are saying that you're doing the internet and social media and you're coming right up front about social stuff. And I'm going to ask you a question about everything that I've been complaining about. <laughs> This is just dirty. Thinking back to like all the stuff that we said that you're not, and we know that isogenics is not and so on. Right. How does a pharmacy use some of those tricks that we all hated about MLM right. to bring up a conversation? You know, maybe there's not a way. Maybe it's just all social media. Right. But is there ever a way to have a customer to remember when they're speaking face to face with a friend to think about mentioning a subject that is as boring as pharmacy? Yeah, I, it's a valid question. And I would go back to the philosophy of the, the whole word of mouth and um, kind of that referral base. Like, would could you guys, so I think about my hairstylist, for instance, it costs a little bit of money to get my hair done. And um, she does a great job, but I never really thought about like telling everybody about it. And then one day she handed me a coupon and said, here's 15% off your next haircut if you can introduce me to another client, right? And so what it did was then I've got like, you know, some I, I've got kind of money burning a hole in my pocket thinking who can I, you know, the next time somebody says something about my hair, I'm much more inclined to say, oh, well, I've got this referral you should go check out my friend. And I think that goes back to the whole premise of word of mouth marketing. Um, when you're willing to give your most enthusiastic customer a kickback at whatever percent, they're gonna be more likely to share, right? Yeah. Um, so if there's some kind of referral program that you guys could have with your pharmacies, it would probably motivate your, your patients and your customers 
to bring more people in. And to give them a tool because they don't know your elevator pitch. Right. But if you give them a tool of a business card that they throw in their wallet and it's something coupon-ish or something, both a memory key Mm -hmm. and also a tool that they can lend or give to somebody might be a way to kill two birds with one business card, let's say. For sure. I even think about my chiropractor when I left the other day. They gave me a referral sheet, um, you know, for, I don't know what I was going to get, like a free massage or something if I brought in new clients. Yeah. Because, you know, chiropractors are suffering tremendously right now with people not coming in. Yeah. Um, So it's that whole, um, the whole word of mouth referral piece. Yeah. Um, there's some, you know, there's some value to that. Um, and then, you know, there is the whole creating no like, and trust. I don't know how you do that with a, you take a current technology and apply old philosophies. So for instance, what I do with my LinkedIn bootcamp, and this is maybe something you guys could do with your pharmacies is that I offer up certain freebies each week based off of people who post and tag me in the course on their platform. Mm. So maybe you're not crazy about social media, but if you remember that, you know, um, the average American spends four and a half hours a day there, if you gave them a little hashtag card or something um, and encouraged them to do a selfie, hashtag, tag you guys, um, I do a raffle once a week. Yeah. And I offer people a 30 minute one on one free coaching call. Um, from one person a week. Maybe you guys could offer a free, um, you know, med reconciliation session. That's a great idea because a lot of times people devalue their business with something free or whatever. You know, they do it and then they say something that's just so unrelated. But to say that you're going to give, you know, something of value that really lifts up what the customer can think of you is cool. Well, and think about what you give, if it can create even more no like, and trust and a more of a committed consumer, right? So like, what better way to promote my business than to offer free coaching to someone? Because I know that I'm going to give them tremendous value and they're going to love what they get from my coaching I'm getting publicity to their network because they shared and then they're going to have a great coaching call and they're going to want to come back for more. That sounds like a really good idea. What is now that you've built a lot of this up, you've left pharma and so on. What is your biggest fear right now? And how does that present itself to you? Is it anxiety some depression? Is it this? Is it that? What do you fear over these 20 years that you talked about, whether it's business or personal? Oh my gosh, what a timely question. Total, total timely question. Um, I just had a call with my business coach about this yesterday. Um, It's a good problem to have, but it's something you have to work through when Mm. the abundance is overflowing in all areas. How do you balance it? Right. So um, I've had I have 30 percent growth in sales in my own personal business right now. Uh, We have more people coming in in the last month than I've seen come into my organization in the last three months. So the velocity at which people are coming in is tremendous. And I don't know if part of it's people are more open right now or people just are putting on those 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 COVID-15 and they want to get it off or what. You got a triad of the COVID-15 people actually maybe needing some actual money right now if they got into it, you know, fast enough. And three is the fear of not wanting everything in one basket, as you talked about earlier. So it's uh, at least three reasons. Yeah. And people have down, a lot of people have downtime to to take a look when they didn't before. So I've got that going on. And my LinkedIn coaching is expensive exploding, exploding. So right now, there's only 24 hours in a day. So you talk about what keeps me up at night is, oh my gosh, like one of the reasons I left corporate America was to have more time freedom um, and to be a, a, a more present mother and spouse 
yet still contribute significantly, you know, be able to pay the mortgage, right? And now all of a sudden, it's like pouring opportunity on me. And it's like, I'm tr- do I try to capture it all? Does my family sacrifice because of that? Or do I pull back on one or the other and focus on one at a time? Or what I've done is spend a pretty penny on an incredible business coach who's helping me push and grow and scale both to million dollar businesses and in the process delegate and give certain um, responsibilities to other people. So what I'm learning now is to hire out. And that's been the hardest thing for me, you know, because when I first started in network marketing, it was, well, I might, you know, we talk about that cash flow quadrant and wanting to remove yourself from being the most important variable. And that's one of the things I loved about that first level of growth that I had with network marketing. I had this nice asset going, but now we're going through another momentous change that's requiring more coaching. And so what keeps me up at night right now and full transparency is like, oh my gosh, I asked for all of this. Now can I handle it? Right? Yeah, right. Can I handle it? You know? But is that just kind of a giggle thing? That's not a real worry, though. No, it's an absolute worry because you have to remember when we first talked, why did I leave corporate America? It was getting too big and you're losing your kids and all that kind of stuff. And I walked away from incredible opportunity, right? Because I I had my boundaries. Yeah. Now I'm having to redefine my boundaries. I mean, I'm giggling, but I was crying yesterday. Mm. I know I'm capable, but I have to, I have to hire out the right coaches who've gone before me and trust the process and delegate if I want to grow and scale two businesses at the same time, the way I I envision. I just, I'm going from being an individual entrepreneur to going back into kind of having employees, right? Yeah. I feel sort of bad about saying the giggling part because I forgot about the family. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's that story. It's the guy that You know, went down to Florida, found a guy that was fishing in the day and playing his guitar at night. But both of them, he did so well. He said, listen, why don't you come up north and we'll start this into a company. We'll make a record and we'll do this and you can franchise this and all that. And then 20 years from now, when you're really successful, you can move down to Florida and fish all day and play your guitar at night. Right. Yes. Do, that's what you're dealing with now. That is my exact struggle. And my husband and I have had the conversation. He's like, well, when is it, you know, where is enough enough? Where do you draw the line, right? Like there is incredible opportunity, but we're doing just fine, right? But it, I go back to what we said in the very beginning that I could work 80 hours a week with something that I love and I'm in a space that I love. Right. Um, And so it's really hard to turn it off when you you're in your house, you're running a business from home and you have so many eager professionals with an ear open and you know, you know that you know that you know that you can change their life and build an asset for them. And I'm seeing it unfold right now. And I'm seeing people be able to walk away from their nine to five or scale back their nine to five and Um, it's hard to turn that off. You know, if, if it was just for a corporation and it wasn't like my baby, I could much more easily turn it off. So it is, it's a, I think it's a real struggle with entrepreneurs is like, where do you draw the line? In the past, you could have spent a hundred percent of the time with people that are real happy, their new customers and so on, or, you know, whatever. But now as you get bigger, you've got to spend like, 30% 30% of your week talking to the crabby marketing person and your and your crabby advertising person and your crabby accountant and your crabby all these all these people that are not compared to the new life that you give people the excitement I'm going to call them crabby my point is you're spending a lot more time with your fellow crabby people and not with the beautiful excitement of new customers that's got to be hard to deal with sometimes Yeah, I mean, it's a great point, but I think that hiring them out gives you actually more space and time for the new people. You'd spend some time, if you wanted to, with the newer people, and then the rest would be like a flow more, and they'd be taking care of the flow. 
That's right. The, the, the more process piece, like my personal assistant now, she's actually in my isogenics business and she really is very fluent with it. And she's also helped me launch my boot camps. And so my goal is for her to really kind of help run um, a lot of what goes on on those platforms behind the scenes. And she, she does already. Um, but my business coach, you know, she has challenged me in saying, you know, instead of feeling like there's so much business, there's going to be less time with the kids, you need to figure out what is it that I can delegate in the business so that I still have time with the kids. And that's why I hired her, because she helps keep me, she's so business savvy, but she's also a mom, um, making $10 million a year. And she she's very, very good at delegating, but also, um, you know, making sure that that you can do it, you can, you just have to be willing to outsource it. I think the biggest challenge, Mike, is having your act together enough to delegate ahead of time what needs to be delegated. Yeah, right. Getting the right people in place. And yeah, so I had my call with my executive assistant right before you and I literally have to give myself an like an hour before my call with her to make sure I have everything together that I need to ask her to pull through. Two last things. One is, are you going to write a book? You know, I've been asked that a couple times. Right now, maybe one day. Um, right now, I'm still in the process of getting a podcast up and running, which I would love for you to be a guest on. Oh, I'd love to. One day, maybe in the future, there's so much opportunity with my businesses right now, I just don't have time. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think I should? Do you ever get magnets like sent in the mail to you? Sometimes from like my real estate agent and stuff. Yeah, pizza or real estate or something. Yeah. And if you get a real good magnet, you know, it's like three by five, a hefty magnet and so on. They're kind of hard to throw away because it's like, I don't know how the hell magnets work, but you kind of think like that's metal or something. I just can't throw that away. There's something <laughs> to that. Right, you know? right, right. And if you compare magnet to like a flyer or something, you say, well, that's just a flyer. I'm just going to throw that away. But a magnet... You have to at least look at it and, and you know, you know, wobble it and stuff. And make, you know, it's cool. It's a magnet. I don't know why, but it's cool. But that's what a book is because all the stuff that you're doing now is really cool, really cool. But it's changing. It's flowing in that. And people say, well, I like that because I like to learn about the new things that are coming. And I like to learn Melissa's changing environment and so on. But the book says – I believe in this so much, I'm going to put it on paper with a, a cover, and I'm the authority, and this is my stamp in time to say, I'm here. And this is an unchanging, time will pass, but it's an unchanging message with my name on it, and it's just powerful. Yeah. You know, maybe save time and just buy nice magnets. <laughs> right. I think you would do a real nice book. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You know, it's it's funny when I was cleaning out my desk when we moved um, from our last house and I was retiring from corporate America, I found a sheet of paper that I had to write out my personal mission statement when I was in Big Pharma, when I was going through leadership training. And one of my biggest missions in life has been to set the example that you can live a healthy, well-balanced life, right? And you know, be happy and healthy, be a great leader, but also be an, a, a very present parent. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, and it was just so surreal cleaning out my office, having quit my corporate job and finding that mission statement. And I think that that's where my passion lies so heavily with e-commerce and the business of the 21st century, century in 2020, that we can have it all. We can build something and, but still have time freedom. That's your book. Yeah. You need that book for all of your people to point to. It's hmm. a good point. Get on that. Yeah. Add that to my anxiety, Mike. <laughs> you know what you do? You hire someone, you get a ghostwriter, and you sit there and they ask the right questions. And right now, someone could take this and they could put this into three or four chapters. You covered this, you covered huh. that. And then once you get into your podcast, you'll be talking about these things. They listen to someone, some of them and they put them all together and you got your book. Huh. I didn't even know that was a thing. Well, I'm not sure either. But Ghostwriters. But it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's the last question, Melissa. Okay. You talked about this book earlier, this 
Blue Ocean. Oh, yeah. So good. I think you got the title wrong. I, I ain't no genius, but listen to my thinking. Okay. Everybody's in a blue ocean. That's the color of oceans. Are you sure they didn't go up to the red ocean? Yeah, so great point. The, the whole premise is that in the red, in the red ocean, it's like a, a feeding frenzy, right? Where there's a bunch of sharks. With all the blood. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, see, and you're taking it to a fresh new ocean yeah. without all the blood. That's right. So in a, in, a, in a red ocean, everyone is in a competing market trying to one up, do something just slightly different to just differentiate themselves. It's all about the sharks and fighting the sharks. Right. And so the blue ocean, there that the book is all about instead of instead of um, competing with everyone else, go do something completely different, right? Um, and create an entirely new market. Okay. And so a market that didn't exist before. And so what you see in a lot of historical MLMs is people chasing down friends and family and downtrodden, desperate folks who like, you know, don't have two pennies to rub together, right? Right. I've shifted to a blue ocean of professionals on a professional platform that are looking to build out an asset. They already show up in life. They're not down and trodden. They just yeah. are not happy with where they are today. They've got a lot of juice left. They've got a lot of grit. They're just not happy with where they are. And so this is a blue ocean where I can cast a vision and present an opportunity to build an asset to create the freedom that they truly want. And it's so blue because no one's over there, which is why my LinkedIn bootcamp has been so successful because people want to learn how to, to be on that platform. Okay, I don't want my listeners staying up at night. Like at three in the morning, they're like, wait a minute. That wasn't a blue. That was a red. You know, <laughs> I'm doing that as a gift to the listeners. Yeah. And I'm sure some of your listeners have read the book. I highly recommend it. It'll probably give your um, independent pharmacy practice or like practice folks some ideas on how to, how to create a blue ocean market within their pharmacy. What I liked about your third business, your third coaching is people get stuck in saying something has to be new. The most creative people, they've defined it basically by taking something that they've experienced somewhere else in a different field and then moving it to the new field, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So, and that's what you're talking about. You're, you're using what you learned with your first two businesses then and just moving it over. And that's very creative. Right. Absolutely. Well, and that's my business coach says, you know, your future clients, your customers will present to you what they want next, what they need, you know, you know, you're as as an entrepreneur, you're constantly thinking about what's the next thing I can put out there. But if you just ask your consumers, many times they'll tell you, you know, what's the next thing? Ask and listen. Mm -hmm. Well, Melissa, what a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I really appreciate um, you having me on and um, giving me the opportunity to, to educate, you know, your listeners a little bit and, um, you know, just have this fun conversation. No like and trust. No like and trust. When you are 100% authentically yourself online, it comes through that way. And people know that people know when you're being your authentic self. So I think you knew what you're getting yourself into when you opened the door, <laughs> right? Well, maybe, but I also have the advantage just to never air it. So that yeah, that's helps. true. <laughs> Very true. But not there. this one for sure is going <laughs> to. All right, Melissa, take care. We'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike.